a moderated discussion. Even though the person we're going to be talking to probably needs very little introduction, I'm going to do one anyway. So, um, best known as the whistleblower in the Facebook Cambridge Analytica data scandal and previously director of research at Cambridge Analytica, this gentleman is best known for setting up and taking down cyber, where, uh, cyber warfare for cyber warfare firm Cambridge Analytica. He has been listed as Times 100 most influential people in the world, Forbes 30 under 30, Politico's 50 most influential people in politics. Let's just put it this way. When he speaks out about the future of technology, governments around the world take note. Ladies and gentlemen, please give an incredibly warm welcome to Christopher Wiley! Yes. You're welcome. So you can have a seat. Hi. Moderating this discussion, also potentially needing no introduction, as I think you all know him very well, journalist and TV presenter, Andreas Tapanas. Hi. Oops. Hi, Chris. Hi. Okay, so let's grab some water and uh, we can start. And we can start, Chris, by, uh, by asking you to give some background on uh, how, how do you feel being uh, the personal enemy and I, I think I can say that, the personal enemy of Facebook, maybe Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg himself, and also... They're not fans. They're not fans. <laughs> They're not fans. They're not followers. No. No. And you are banned in, on Facebook. And Instagram. And Instagram. Okay. <laughs> so basically, what is life then worth living for if you are banned on Instagram? How yeah, do you cope? I, 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 I have a dearth of uh, thirst picks and well-curated uh, avocado toast. So it's, oh, right. uh, it's uh, yeah, I, I've, I've, but I, no, um, it's, <clears throat> it might be helpful. Can everybody hear me, by the way? I just always check, so yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. Cool. Hi. It's, uh, it's strange acoustics, but it, it goes well. Okay, cool. I always just want to make sure. Um, so it, I mean, it might be helpful for people who don't know to sort of give a bit of the the background sure, to absolutely. Um, what Cambridge Analytica was and how it became Cambridge Analytica. Um, so when I, when I first um, started working uh, in the office that eventually became Cambridge Analytica, uh, that company was but a twinkle in Steve Bannon's eye. It, mm. it didn't actually exist yet. Um, when I started, I worked at a company called um, SDL Group, which is, was a... Um, military contractor that specialized in information operations, um, which involves um, counterinsurgency efforts, uh, counterpropaganda efforts. Um, it worked in the Baltics uh, quite a bit, actually, for NATO, um, ironically countering Russian propaganda. Um, and when I first started, it was because um, the firm understood that DARPA, which is the US military's research agency, was investing in uh, research to do with essentially um, profiling people uh, with a particular focus on psychological profiling of people on the internet. Um, the reason for that is because modern security threats for Western nations, at least, um, often are organized and emerge online. So if you think about you know, ISIS, which at the time was a threat, um, you know, it organized online, it recruited online, it disseminated its messages online, and militaries had historically invested R&D funding in things like missiles and, you know, all kinds of, you know, explosive, what you call kinetic weaponry. Um, and there was not that much understanding about how this new domain of the battle space, the internet, um, would, would work and how do we create tools uh, and potentially weapons mm. to counteract those threats because you can't shoot a tank at the internet, right? Yeah. Um, and so uh, when I got brought on, it was because at the time I was doing um, PhD research and it was actually in cultural trend forecasting. So there was, I had a particular focus on, on fashion, but it was a machine learning uh, focus on how to quantify cultural narratives and then look for attributes within the population that can give you indicators as to how things will spread 
right? Um, so I got brought on, and the first uh, part of my time at SCL was focused on doing R&D for things that ultimately were for counterinsurgency, counterpropaganda, the defense of democratic nations. Yes. Um, one of our uh, clients um, who was working with U.S. Air Force Cyber Command um, happened to meet um, somebody who worked for Steve Bannon, introduced Steve Bannon to my boss at the time, Alexander Nix. And uh, Steve was uh, essentially, at the time, the editor of Breitbart, which is a very right-wing um, news site. And the founder of Breitbart, before he died, Andrew Breitbart is named after him, um, you know, he always said that uh, politics flows from culture, right? So if you want to change politics, if you can change culture, politics will just naturally fo follow that. Yeah. Um, and so Breitbart was originally envisioned to be a, 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 a medium of cultural change in, in America. Um, it became very niche, though. It became a glorified hate blog for straight white dudes who can't get laid. And, and I say that actually purposely. I mean, the incel community, which is involuntary celibate community, guys who literally can't get laid, is a big part of the alt-right. Um, and uh, you know, from that stems a lot of misogyny and jealousy and all that, which then he curated into forming a troll army. But the problem was that it, he was stuck into a, a niche, right? Crazy right-wingers mm -hmm. who can't get laid, right? It was a very small niche. Very small niche um, and other things. So uh, he, when he got introduced to Alexander Nix, he realized that in order to fight a culture war, right, he was thinking about it wrong. He was using this term culture war and not realizing that in order to fight a war, you have to map out your battle space mm. and you need an arsenal of weaponry and you need a strategy, right? Um, and when you think about weapon systems, right, you typically have something, you know, if you think about a missile, a torpedo, for example, right, it is a weapon system specific for an aquatic environment, underwater, right? A torpedo doesn't work on land, right? It doesn't work in the air. It only works underwater, right? So that is a specific weapon design for that niche, that specific battle space, and it has a payload, which is explosive, and a targeting system, which is whatever, sonar that follows the noise of a boat or whatever, right? When you think about culture or information as a domain of battle, you then have to ask the question, what are weapons that have a payload and a targeting system that I can use in the same way that a torpedo works underwater, what works in this domain of culture. Okay. And so what he realized was that the work that we were doing in counterinsurgency uh, or counterpropaganda could be inverted to create or curate uh, an insurgency, and that's what he actually wanted. So he introduces Alexander Nix to a billionaire by the name of Robert Mercer, who made all of his money in the 90s uh, in a hedge fund called Renaissance Top Technologies. It was, it was one of the first hedge funds that actually used um, quantitative finance and, and algorithms to make money. So, and he has a PhD um, in computer uh, science. So he is very technically minded, understands algorithms. You know, data and algorithms don't scare him. He became a billionaire literally because of algorithms. And so the... So Bannon convinced Mercer to acquire the company. The reason we had to get acquired was because Nix originally tried to um, work with Bannon to become a client. The problem with that is that if you're doing military research, you can't actually uh, sell that research, right? You know, mm. if, you're, if you're designing a weapon or defense to a weapon and the, the, the client is, is, is a military client, you can't then just sell it to anybody who has a briefcase of cash, right? So their solution was to acquire the company, um, and they did. And then uh, Steve came in, and he uh, then essentially took over the management of the company. And it was at that point where the work that we were doing in profiling um, then got inverted and applied to American citizens. Um, the research that DARPA was funding on psychological profiling um, was actually the basis of our research. It's interesting because actually a lot of tech companies were involved in that, mm. right? Facebook uh, worked on DARPA-funded projects. Yahoo, IBM 
Lots of tech companies worked on these projects, which then later formed partly the basis of Cambridge Analytica. Um, what happened, and what I found so disturbing, was that when essentially the, the role of psychological profiling uh, is like your targeting system on your torpedo or in your missile, right? It finds the target, right? The payload is some kind of narrative that's, that's geared towards a particular uh, cognitive vulnerability that that type of person has, more than the rest of the population. And so a lot of these um, narratives that then got developed usually targeted people who were more prone or could be more prone to uh, paranoids, uh, or conspiratorial thinking. And when the, the company started collecting Facebook data, and then created, they set up these groups and pages, and they identified people based on the, the, the like profile that they had, mm. who would be you know, uh, more likely to be uh, vulnerable to, you know, paranoia or conspiratorial thinking. It's a very small niche of people, but in order to start an insurgency, you have to seed it with a small group of people. So this okay. is the low-hanging fruit. They would be invited to these groups, and then they would start interacting with these groups. But uh, Chris, let me let me maybe stop you for a moment and let's dwell on on this change of direction that your company and you yeah. yourself have been taking. You said it, uh, that it's uh, disturbing, but. Uh, what, what did you feel when, when you changed the, the, when you felt the change of direction? Well, uh, this was the change of direction, right? So, so what happened was people would be brought into groups and they would start, they would start talking to people in these groups, mm -hmm. not realizing that the people that they're talking to aren't real. And the thing about how Facebook worked at the time is that the news feed was very sensitive. So if you joined things that looked very different, from what the sort of normal population was, uh, was, was engaging with, that's what made you kind of unique. And so in order to optimize your engagement, Facebook's algorithm would then start recommending stuff that was similar to what you were seeing. So you, you mean that at first you didn't realize that you were building a torpedo? No, we were. I knew what we were doing. I knew that we were building a torpedo, but mm. the torpedo is to shoot at those guys, not at ourselves. No, but I mean, yeah, the torpedo which shoots at, at ourselves. No. Well, what, this was already built. This is the thing. So the, the, a lot of the technologies that uh, we had developed Okay, so you have to just to align the, the, the targets, right? just to switch the targets. Yeah, I mean, you can, a, a missile works whether you're shooting a plane with an American flag on it or a plane with a Lithuanian flag or a Russian flag. It doesn't care what the flag is. You, you just have to assign it a target, right? A condition to target. Hmm. Um, and so the... You know, th these people would be invited into these groups. Then the, their profiles would start getting dominated with information that was similar to what they were seeing on these groups, right? So Facebook's, Facebook did sort of half of the work, just in the, in the fact that it was optimizing for engagement, right? Um, and the problem with that is that then once these groups got to a couple thousand people, they would be locally, uh, locally specific. So it would be, you know, Smith County Patriots or whatever. Mm -hmm. There would then be events. They'd be invited to join these uh, events, and even if five to ten percent of people actually showed up to these events, there'd be a couple hundred people that show up. They would be, you know, at you know coffee shops or a bar or whatever, and you get a hundred people all at the same time going into a coffee shop, and all of a sudden these people who are indulging in this online fantasy all of a sudden see quote unquote everybody like them who don't have an agenda, quote unquote all talking about these things that I don't see on the mainstream media. And so what started as sort of dabbling in an online fantasy became very real for these people, and then they started self-organizing. And that was happening all over the United States, mm. right? And so that's a, and, and that is a very similar technique that um, militaries will use to try to undermine um, organizations or, or, or nations or quasi-nations like ISIS by seeding insurgencies cells to start to self-organize and then they grow and recruit themselves. And so the, the problem with that though is that the, the kinds of things that Steve then wanted to organize around, things like race realism, which essentially encourages people to indulge their racial biases more and more and more, 
was highly problematic. And, and a lot of the stuff that they started doing was flat out illegal. But the problem is that when you work for a, a company where the entire leadership of the company is d making the decisions about what to do, and that's illegal. It's not like you can go to HR yeah. and say, can I like, file complaints because everything that our company is doing is illegal, right? Like, you just can't, it doesn't yeah. work that way. So um, I left, um, and they immediately uh, sued me f f for you know, months and months and months and months. Um, and uh, when I tried to report it... But you left with uh, a little bit of data with you. You took a little bit of data. With you, files, right? yeah. Yes, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, 87 million files. No, no. I, no. Th so the data didn't come with me. Okay. The data didn't come with me. Um, but files, files d certainly came with me. And when I first reported it, um, no one was very, in, you know, the, the problem is you, you go to an authority, right? You have to remember this is just before Brexit and just before Trump, right? Mm. So it's hard to th imagine back. Like Trump at the time was like a talk show, you know, type person. You know, he's, he's a character. He's not like yeah. a, a threatening world stability, right? Yeah, Hillary will, will win, but this guy is fun. And so you go to an authority and you go, okay, so there's this company. It was a military company. It's being repurposed. Um, you know, it's harvested all this data unlawfully. Um, they've hired all these people who work for the Russian government. Um, you know, the, the, and they're, they're manipulating people to uh, indulge in conspiratorial thinking and racism. Um, and you know half of the team uh, you know is working with you know r russian funded research and like this looks like a this looks like a problem hmm. right and the stories just kind of go like i don't understand like where what box do i check like is this a burglary no is this like a like what is this it's like okay i'll check other like cyber crime all right i'll file that and send that somewhere like it was only after brexit happened and then after Trump happened, that then people actually started paying attention to what this company was doing. Mm. But at that point, obviously, it was too, too late. Too late. Um, but I then got reapproached um, the, originally by the, the Guardian. And I started working with the authorities. And then you know, the story eventually rolled out. But the Guardian journalist uh, said that it took uh, her, uh, I think it, it was a she, right? Yeah. Uh, almost a year to yeah, pursue did. you, right? So. Yeah. What was holding you back? Oh, no, it, it, took, it didn't take a year to pursue me. It took a year to release the story. Okay. Yeah. So, so to, I was... To, I to, was to an, get all the, I was, the, I, the yeah, pieces. Yeah, because there was... Um, I had some of the files, but not all of the files. There were other people involved. Um, there were also a huge host of legal issues and then also safety issues, mm. right? At the time, Steve Bannon was in the National Security Council the United States of America, with full access to the security intelligence apparatus of the largest and most powerful country in the world, right? We, I had, uh, you know, uh, uh, evidence of um, the Russian embassy's uh, involvement, the, the L Russian embassy in London's involvement, and Brexit, um, where they were regularly meeting with the top donors for uh, the uh, Leave campaign. Um, emails from the, the embassy, like, that was an issue because, you know, what happens if they find out and if, so you've got the United States is going to be pissed off. You now got Russia is going to be pissed off. And then lo and behold, you've got this giant company Facebook is going to get pissed off too. And so it's, you know, when you're pissing off that many powerful th th things, it's, it's very rare to piss off both the United States and Russia at the yes, same time. It's, it takes a special kind of talent. Yeah. You know, uh, where they both hate you. Mm. And no, you should be China then. I think the China. On, only I, the China I, 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 I didn't. I didn't quite get to that level. Maybe mm. next time. Um, um, but uh, you know, so that took a lot of legal work. There were all kinds of safety issues. Not just safety issues for me. There were people who were um, uh, involved whose lives would be literally put at risk because they were current at the time operating in countries where it was very easy to take them out. Mm -hmm. So those people had to first, we had to make sure that they were safe before stuff came out. Um, you know, this is a company that, um, you know, in the United States was manipulating the election, but in, you know, places like Africa or South Asia did a lot more 
than yeah. just some cyber work, right? Okay. And so we had to make sure that people were safe. My lawyers were very concerned about my own safety, let alone the fact, what, is, you know, what do we do if the Trump administration, which already was trying to influence legal investigations into its, you know, with Mueller and all of that, already trying to interfere with uh, law enforcement, what happens if they get the DOJ, Department of Justice, to you know, indict me on some random thing, or they try to um, extradite me to the United States? What happens then? What do we do? So there's a whole bunch okay, of planning so that had to happen. Preparations and planning ahead. Yeah. So you were expecting that uh, all hell will break loose after you release the, the information. But did you expect that it will break loose on such a massive scale that you're going to be you know, testifying before U.S. Senate uh, and you're yeah. going to inspire uh, a, a massive change of laws? Well, do you know, what, one of the things that all of us uh, who were involved in this uh, did not expect was Facebook's reaction. Because, and, and Facebook, I think their reaction really um, made the story much bigger because it, they showed their cards. Mm. Um, we went to Facebook before the story came out and told them in advance about the story coming out. And the reason we did that was in good faith to give them time, A, to respond, and B, time to think about what it is that they're going to do in order to solve the problem. Did you... And what they, th what they did instead is, uh, you know, they then sent me uh, letters threatening me with various things. Um, they then uh, announced that they were banning me, and they had, the, the story came out early because they tried to get ahead of it mm. by blaming me for everything, blaming me for the lack of security that they had on their system. And the problem you know, for them was they thought, okay, this is going to ruin their story. We'll get around it because we're getting ahead. We'll ban this guy. We're going to blame this guy. But it just blew it up because um, I had been already been working. I wasn't under investigation. Facebook was under investigation. I was the witness. I was helping the authority. I was the one that brought the information to the authority, not them. Mm. And they did not calculate, they did not put into their calculation that I actually wasn't just doing it for attention. I had spent the past year actually working on a law enforcement investigation before anything came out. And so when they when they threatened journalists, when they threatened me, um, when they lied to The Guardian, um, you know, they said they were going to sue for defamation because none of it's true, at the same time threatening me to report me to the authorities because all of it was true, um, you know, that they, they really revealed that they, they only care about protecting the reputation. And when you then look at how they've then dealt with the law enforcement investigations and also the um, legislative inquiries that have happened all around the world, they've literally just ignored them, mm. right? They don't, they, Mark Zuckerberg refuses to show up to any other, you know, he went to Congress yes. and, you know, explained that he makes money from advertising to senators who didn't know anything about the internet. Um, he won't go anywhere else because he knows that he's going to get actual tough Questions. And what I think really started to enrage people, particularly outside of the United States, is you think that you live in a sovereign country of laws, but when you've actually copied your society into an American company, into a social network, right, and then there's a problem, you realize that that, that company doesn't care about your laws and doesn't care about your election. They care about the profit that they're making. Mm. And so they won't even show up to answer questions unless it is the American government. And what it showed was that, you know, historically, you know, for the past sort of 10 years beforehand, Silicon Valley had got a free ride in terms of, you know, they, everybody, the, 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 you had, they had glowing media and all yeah, these people and innovation and, yeah. oh, my God, look at how amazing all of this mm. is. And what turned, particularly given the reaction that Facebook had, was actually... Facebook is just like any other company. It's just like an oil company, right? They will cover stuff up. They will threaten people. They will do whatever it takes to make sure that their bottom line doesn't get hurt, even if that means sacrificing the democracy of, nat of nations. But uh, don't you think that uh, some writers, science fiction writers who were writing cyberpunk novels, they predicted that the time will come when, when the corporations will be above 
the governments, unless yeah. it's a mega government. So it's coming true. We were warned. Y well, y yes, we've also been warned about lots of things, like climate change. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't just because we, you know, we shouldn't try to prevent that from becoming. I would rather that stay in science fiction than come into science reality. Right? Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I, I don't want Facebook to be the world government. I don't want these techno technical companies to be the government of us. Because they're, they, they don't, we, we aren't citizens of Facebook. We're citizens of our nations, right? Um, we are citizens of, the, of our communities that are, and our societies. And there's a very big difference between a government and a corporation. A government has to consider its citizenry, right? A, a company has to consider its shareholders. And unless you're a shareholder, the company doesn't care. And you know, the, the, the real risk that we have is when we, when we start imagining, okay, 10, 20 years down the road, where we've got, you know, what, 5G, whatever the next generation, 5, 10G, you know, uh, whatever that is, where we've got the proliferation of uh, mass communication networks everywhere, every device is connected to AI, right, where all of a sudden, you know, you sit in your living room and you're never alone anymore because your refrigerator watches you, your TV watches you, your phone, every device watches you and communicates to something else about you with the sole purpose of optimizing you and your behavior as a consumer. And the problem with that is that if you imagine a life where you are now in, a, in, a, in an environment where the environment at all points in time Every building that you go into, every street that you walk in, every car that you get into, even your own living room watches and thinks about you, and not only watches and thinks about you, but tries to influence and moderate your behavior, where it can see you at all times, but you can't see it. What do you do in that situation when only a couple people or a couple companies control that AI? Because if you think about it, something that can watch you at all times, that seeks to judge you and influence your behavior, you know, where it's everywhere, but you can't see it, but it can see you, it sounds like God. And the danger that I think we are walking into, not immediately, but 10, 20 years out, is if we create a constructed environment which is aware of us, and we don't think carefully about who gets to control that awareness and who gets to control what doors open or don't open for us, how fast our car gets to go, like what food can we or can't we see when we want to order something, who watches our kids when they're sleeping. When, when, when we, if, if we aren't thinking about that, what's going to happen is you're going to get a company like Facebook do it, do, setting that up. Right? And my, my concern is that when you look at how Facebook has reacted to the Cambridge Analytica story, let alone other things that have happened that Western media haven't paid attention to, when you look at when the United Nations warned Facebook that Facebook's products in, in Myanmar were being used to amplify hate messaging and organize mass murder and genocide of Rohingya Muslims in that country, they didn't do anything about it. They let people die. They let people burn villages. The same thing happened in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka has now turned off Facebook for the entire mm -hmm. country because it was being used for hate propaganda and literally people were dying in things that were being organized on that platform and they didn't bother to do anything about it. So if genocide is not enough for a company to act, I have a real concern about what happens 10, 20 years down the road where we've got AI everywhere and that's the ethics of the company that's controlling it. Okay. Chris, let me, uh, let me be clear and ask you uh, uh, one very concrete question. So, uh, from what, what I hear, uh, okay, uh, uh, you threw a bomb uh, at, at Facebook. Uh, it, Facebook survived. And now you are waging this one-man war against mega corporation, right? You are going around the world talking about your concerns, expressing them. You are sniping at them on social media that you are still allowed, so namely Twitter, I suppose. Yeah. Something, some, some, maybe something else, but Twitter. No, no, Twitter, it's tw Twitter has been banned. So me. because uh, like 90% uh, of your posts are about Facebook and, 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 and criticizing and, and putting pins. And this looks to me like a classical situation when there is a mega corporation and there's like one bright colored uh, preacher who is standing and shouting from 
from top of his lungs. What is your end goal? What do you expect to, to gain, to reach? Yeah. Just express your concern and get some applause from the audience because, yeah, no. because uh, this it, snowball is rolling, yeah. you know? Yeah. So uh, we, we're now, th so the United States is super critical in all of this, right? I say this, I'm Canadian, I live in Britain, I'm not American, but I recognize that all of these companies are in the United States and they won't change unless there is uh, legislation, legislation and action in that jurisdiction. So I work a lot with uh, American politicians and law enforcement agencies and regulatory agencies to explain to them, yeah, uh, when there's not a camera around, I spend a lot of time explaining how the internet works and what the, where the potential problems are. You need to explain and, that to them, right? And I say, well, you know, I, people like to sort of make snappy remarks about, you know, and I'm guilty of this too, uh, about politicians and not understanding technology. But do you understand how a nuclear reactor works? Really? Do you understand how a plane flies? Really? Uh, yeah, we've seen the we, HBO series on we, Chernobyl, so we, we know now how a right, reactor works. Right. So, or rather, how it doesn't work. Yeah, uh, uh, how it how blow but, up, blows but, up. But, you know, so I actually don't fault senators and elected officials for not understanding how algorithms work okay. because we would not expect our politicians to understand, you know, molecular chemistry when it comes to, you know, the health and safety of people with, dr you know, drug and pharmaceutical regulation or, you know, what, what is the engineering standards of a plane to make it safe or a nuclear reactor, right? What we do in those circumstances is we create legislation and appoint a regulator of technically competent people to then set the safety standards. Because lay people, including our elected officials, do not have as the sufficient knowledge and never will have the sufficient, sufficient knowledge to keep up with technology. The problem is that for some reason, when it comes to software and AI, um, and more broadly, the internet, there's, there's, this, there's this sort of saying that Silicon Valley keeps pushing, which is bullshit which is the law can't keep up with technology. And what they actually mean is elected officials don't know enough about these, this technology, and they're the ones that have to do the, the rulemaking. But you, would not, but you wouldn't ever hear you know, a pharmaceutical company saying, you know, we should have no uh, rules on pharmaceutical safety because our politicians can't follow mm. cancer research. Like, that just sounds stupid. So actually, when you start thinking about it in other industries, it sounds insane. Um, because, you know, the, and, and when you actually look at the development of, you know, uh, safety in other, in, you know, in, in, in other industries, like the automotive industry, when rules were being considered to uh, mandate uh, seat belts and airbags in cars, auto companies said the same thing. Like, this is going to make things more expensive, it's a consumer choice, like, you know, this is going to in inhibit our, the development of innovation in our cars, blah, blah, blah. They'll be heavier. We'll have to pay more for gas. It's all going to be mm. terrible. Um, and now would you get in a car that doesn't have seat belts and airbags? Probably not. Mm. Um, the arguments are bullshit that they make. Um, and the thing that I'd say is that if, the, if you need to rely on an argument that safety will inhibit innovation, I question if that innovation should be made if it's not safe. And, you know, when, you go, when you've got companies saying, uh, you know, like Facebook, after uh, the New Zealand uh, massacre that happened that was live streamed on their platform it, that took them, you know, ages to actually take down, they say, well, you know, a lot of things happen on our platform, it's really complicated, we're everywhere in the world, I take that defense and I flip it back and I say, well, that's exactly why you need to be regulated because you don't know how your own system works and you prioritize different things. You put out products before you know how they work. You put out products that threaten people's safety before you know how they work. And your defense that this is really complicated and it's hard to manage such a big thing is exactly why you should be regulated. So you expect uh, a war, uh, a legislative war between government and, uh, or governments, as in the EU uh, example, and mega corporations like Facebook, Google, and, 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 and Amazon, which would last forever? 
Well, I, my... do you know what? I don't think it should be a war. I, you know, I talk a lot to um, engineers and data scientists um, all over the world, uh, some of whom work for big tech companies. And I don't think most engineers or data scientists become engineers or data scientists because they want to create things that commit harm. Mm. I genuinely don't think that. Um, and you know, so I don't think that it has to be, fr I don't like framing it as a war because it's not actually a war amongst a lot of the engineers. It's just there are certain people at the top of certain companies that have their head stuck in the ground and they don't want to accept the reality that they've created something that is potentially dangerous to the functioning of democracy. Okay. But when you look at actually, you know, engineers and data scientists, I've met tons and tons and tons that say they want to create ethical things. I, I, don't, I genuinely don't think most, you know, most engineers are somehow innately evil. And so I don't think it has to be a war. I think that most people, like if you worked in any other profession, if you are an accountant, lawyer, teacher, doctor, nurse, whatever, you've got professional conduct standards and ethical requirements for how you conduct yourself and what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. And I don't see why we can't have that for technology. I think ethics is something that has been really lagging in technology. Okay. And, and I don't think that it needs to be a war uh, in the same way that I don't think that, you know, uh, it's a war to say that airplanes should be safe and, and pharmaceuticals should be safe. Mm. It's not a war. And I think a lot of cancer researchers don't go in to cancer research wanting to harm people or make lots of money even though it kills people, right? So, it's not a war. It's, it's just we have to collectively come to an understanding that safety matters, our democracy matters, and the functioning of our public forum and discourse matter. Okay. So, uh, Chris, we have 10 more minutes. Uh, about safety, do you feel safe yourself right now? Um, well, yes. On a scale of uh, 1 to 10. Uh, 1, very not safe. 10, uh, totally uh, safe. I, 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 I won't put a number on it, but I, I'll, <laughs> I'll um, you know, like I do travel around with um, bodyguards, mm. and uh, there's risk assessments that are done when I go to different places. Um, you know, when you piss off a lot of people, there you get a lot of threats. Um, I've been assaulted several times in the street. Um, I've had all kinds of things happen, which By I won't who? get into. By who? Who would assault you? What kind of? Uh, various people. Various people. Various people. Yeah. Obvi which is obviously people. Yes. Um, and uh, you know that that does present a safety issue. Okay. Um, but I, I, I. I, I it, I do, it doesn't bother me, you know, if it means that, um, you know, we can actually start changing this really important thing. I mean, the internet, the internet, and and tech and AI, you know, historically has been treated as some niche issue, right? It's not big and important like foreign relations or you mm. know healthcare or whatever, right? But like, if you think about it, how many times, you know, do you check your phone each day? Right? You know, people check their phones hundreds of times a day. They go to bed with their phones. They sleep with their phones more than they sleep with people. Right? The first thing and last thing they see is a screen. Right? So you've got something that's really intimately connected to people's lives. It's the same when people get anxious when they lose their phone. Like, I, like all of a sudden, like, I can't function. I can't talk, talk to anyone. I don't know where I am. I'm like codependent on my phone. Mm. Right? So these are really powerful things. And I, you know, if it, if it means that, you know, some people don't like me, then okay. Um, you know, if, if that means that now, for the first time, like, ever, we're, we're having legitimate discussions in the United States about the first, you know, federal-level privacy legislation. I, I think that's great. Mm. So, I don't care if somebody doesn't like me. I mean, if, if it means that, you know, we can prevent you know, the scenario that I was talking about before, yeah. then great. Okay, uh, on a little bit lighter note, uh, when you were talking about uh, uh, information that is being put into people's mind and uh, 
maybe controlling the mass into electing something or into using something for a short period, you made a very interesting analogy. You compared Crocs and Donald Trump. Yeah. Uh, how did you manage to put all so, these two things together? Can so, you explain? Yeah, a, a, a lot of people, so it's sort of a little bit random, but like my, the, the research that I was doing um, when I was doing my PhD was in um, cultural trend forecasting. A lot of that had to do with fashion trends. Um, and I am a nerd, so I, the cool thing about fashion, not just that it's, there's cool clothes and all that, but from a computer vision standpoint, it was just really interesting to try to understand how do I recognize style? Not like, is this a t-shirt, is this blue, whatever, mm -hmm. but like, is this like sexy or boring or like these very sort of nuanced constructs that mean different things to different people. How can we like teach a machine to understand that? And so when I started working at, um, you know, SCL group before it became Cambridge Analytica, like I was doing cyber warfare stuff and fashion stuff mm. at the same time. And the reason why I talk about, you know, Donald Trump as being Crocs is that Crocs, I don't know if people know what Crocs are. They're like this like... Hey, oh, yes, we do. They, oh, yes. Okay. Perfect shoes. They're like these ugly rubber plastic things that you put on your feet. They look like buckets, but you put them on your feet and they have like holes in them. And yeah. I think some of them have handles. Like, yeah? Yeah, like a bucket. Very comfortable. Sure. Oh. So, um, now, if, if somebody was wearing Crocs in the 90s, people would be like, what the actual, like, what are you wearing? That's <laughs> for dick, right? And now, probably people would start being like, why are you wearing Crocs, man? Those aren't, those aren't cool anymore. But there was a moment in time where this thing, which pretty much everybody except you agrees is ugly. I just said, um, no, 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 I and, just said, it's comfortable. And, 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 you know, it, they are a hideous shoe. They're ugly. They're, and they're not even functional, right? They've got holes in them. They don't even keep you dry. Yeah, you know, if you're on an escalator, your toe might stick out and fall off. I don't even know, right? So the reason why it's helpful to think about Crocs in relation to Donald Trump is that at one moment in time, everybody was wearing something that was stupid. Stupid, ugly, and grotesque, and a mockery of what a shoe should be. And when you had Donald Trump get elected, who is like literally this like orange Cheeto of a man, right? <laughs> who is a mockery of a president, who is ugly. And yet for a moment in time, everybody votes for him. Hmm. And that's because people can adopt and engage with ugliness in all kinds of forms for moments in time, if there's suffic a sufficient number of people around them doing it. Um, and when you look at um, trend forecasting, particularly like computational approaches to trend forecasting, you know, this is a very important idea that like you have, there's a critical mass that you have to reach and then everybody starts yeah. doing stuff. Um, and what I want is for Donald Trump to be like Crocs in the past, regrettable, destroy all the photos of you wearing it and be done with it. Um, but my worry is that if we don't understand who he is, that he will move from being a regrettable, ugly shoe into a long-lasting legacy. Which exactly, I, I, I was thinking that there might be a flaw in your reasoning because, yeah, the Crocs are, um, are culturally dead and they won't, uh, you know, res resurrect. And Donald Trump in 2020, they can go and uh, he can go and win again and summon his legacy as a very successful president of the United States who took uh, both terms. Uh, he could, uh, which is why people need to understand how ugly he is. Mm. <laughs> Just pure and simple. And so, um, you know, it, it, and this is, this is a really important point to understand is that a lot of fascism and a lot of authoritarianism is about the aesthetics of society. It's not about, when you listen to authoritarians, oftentimes they focus on what should society look like? What should it feel like? But oftentimes they don't actually talk about what we should do, what kind of policy should we implement or how should we improve things. It's about how things should look and how things should feel. 
Aesthetics are super important in authoritarianism. This is why one of the first things that authoritarian regimes do is they create uniforms. And that's why authoritarians often have a look, right? If I say the word Nazi, you can picture one in your head. If I say Maoist, you can picture mm. one in your head, right? Yeah. So, you know, or a jihadist, or Ku Klux Klan, they all have aesthetics. And so much of fascism is about aesthetics. It's not about anything else. Um, and that's why you, you get very uh, authoritarian leaders getting away with so much stuff, because they don't actually promise anything. It's all about what things should look like and feel like. And people are engaging on an aesthetic level mm. with, you know, with a president which is dabbling in fascism. And I think it's really important to understand because when people were wearing Crocs, they were an illogical shoe and you couldn't logically convince someone to not wear it if they thought it was cool. So we have to engage people with understanding one of the reasons why people engage with a lot of authoritarian thought is because of an aesthetics aspect. Mm. And that we have to, uh, if we understand that, uh, then, there's, then there's things that we can do to start convincing people that actually this is not the aesthetic that you think it is or that you want. Mm. Well, Chris, um, I still think that Crocs are comfortable. Let's, uh, let's agree to disagree. We will agree to disagree. Absolutely. And our time is up. I thank you very much for, this, uh, for sharing uh, your insights with you. And cool. all the best luck in your uh, endeavor to, to regulate the big corps, because uh, science fiction is coming uh, to be true. Cool. Thank you for having thank me. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you very much, Chris. Ladies and gentlemen, Christopher Wiley. Cheers. Thank you.